second attempt. All of this characteristic of the prevailing phallocracy, summoned as upright witness for the prosecution, Needless to say, we're all of us against thumbs up, even if on those seldom bright nights, sleights of hand, enclosed palmistry, digital universalism, repealed fists still seem capable of saving us. Even pricks, brother, followed by aspirational chanda. Another one bed, pre-furnished, slit, open, punitive, hollow point hen carcass, forcibly thrown up on a tide of dirty blonde and ditched faith. Ultimately, this is how you and I would like to live, how we would like to spend our hours, is what we are like, what we would like and what others like us, what they like about us, which is what we likes our homes and how. An of-age couple, whom notably work during the day and sleep during the night. Pretty apparent that this, their apartment, is a place of caveated living. So when the front door is double locked and the windows are down and blinded, it's truly rough in there, queasy. The walls sweating some sort of spent and vertical shame along with whatever blended sewage of soft-shelled bottom feeders they couldn't keep down after dinner. At night, at least a foot of cooling mattress between them. An acronym for welcome and also a way of spelling hospital. They do mind us all the sign. No reason. Laid to rest in this thin bed and criminally burying, downward motioning, physical process for shame. Pharmacologic prognosis chalked up on the pine headboard, turned the bed recklessly, insouciantly on its side so as to approximate risk-free an outlook over there beneath the room in the sprawling comment section, which we like. Light from the surface peters out completely at this depth. And from now on, we will be relying on the glow from phosphorescent minerals in the surrounding rock, 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 rock. That one again. Light from the surface peters out completely at this depth. From now on, we will be relying on the glow from phosphorescent minerals in the surrounding rock like. I can tell you, brother, that a thousand unhinged teenagers were down here last night. Teenagers holding together down here, wearing out their jeans and licking the wet heads of those stalactites over there and tonguing the fungus from those hot pink tectonic crevices over here. Spent by 5 a.m., they stand right there where you're standing right now and sway in time to that thin masochistic singing most of us are anatomically incapable of hearing past 20, 21. Swaying to the thin singing and the eye-watering accompaniment of young heart magma. A hospital welcome. Welcome. Thanks for coming back, those of you who've come back, and thanks for coming, those who haven't. This is the third and final part of uh, uh, this kind of symposium, I guess, is not the right word, um, uh, unlike. And the first two parts were death and love, and this final part is... Um, is that better? Is, there, is this all sounding okay? Sorry. Um, the final part is words. So... Uh, 
just as a kind of introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, unlike generally and what's kind of been unearthed a little bit so far, but also what um, what words uh, maybe are in this and what maybe some of the things that we're going to talk about today and some of the speakers are going to talk about, but also particularly what words, uh, what kind of place they, they play in some of my own work. So um, unlike kind of founded itself on... Uh, on a particular kind of faith that certain experiences, or that experience per se, uh, was in some way irrecuperable. That culture wouldn't try to, or cultural product particularly, wouldn't try to um, recuperate, or wouldn't be able to uh, make up for the failure of experience in certain ways. Um, also at the same time, the, the unlike was, was some sort of bastard term that would include uh, not not liking things, but a kind of differentiation, something apart from a consensus in a way. So uh, during death, we kind of uh, reached certain points, and love, obviously, we reached certain points where um, both of those things in their kind of scale and their size and their uh, absolute kind of limit in a way were kind of examples of of, of things that would elude because of their, their kind of size of experience in a way, or the fact that they... Uh, they're kind of paradigms in a way of things that are impossible to kind of recuperate in certain ways or represent. Um, not that those two things are uh, interchangeable. So today, in, in words, I think one of the things that we've been dwelling on a lot through the Unlike uh, Symposium has been a sense of loss and, and that recuperation, being against recuperation to a certain degree, we against trying to get back something that was lost so like an experience um, or a relation or those things that were not uh, physical necessarily, but a lost object. Um, and I think today part of what hopefully will start to come out is more of a, a look towards the future or futurity more generally, trying to hold on to some of the themes but also allowing this thing to kind of unravel. And, and I think words obviously which aren't equivalent to love and death, but words being a kind of, uh, obviously the constant thread and the thing that uh, will perform uh, the whole of the unlike in a way. Um, so just to talk a little bit about uh, my own work and the, the kind of place of words within that, uh, I wanted to talk particularly about a poem that um, is recited in a piece of work of mine downstairs uh, called Warm, Warm, Warm Spring Mouths. And it's a poem by a, uh, an American poet called Gilbert Sorrentino, written in 1971, uh, called The Morning Roundup. Um, and it goes, um, I don't want to hear any news on the radio about the weather on the weekend. Talk about that. Once upon a time, a couple of people were alive who were friends of mine. The weather's the weathers they lived in. Christ, the sun on those Saturdays. Um, <clears throat> and in the, in the film, I recite it uh, over and over again via this particular avatar. And there was, there's something in the poem that potentially will come out later in, in other conversations throughout the afternoon, but about the, the narrator's need to speak of something, in this case, the loss of a couple of people um, who one might assume are friends or very close uh, people to him, the desire to speak of them, but the uh, impossibility of doing so or of somehow kind of doing justice to it. Um, and it, it's something that I, I, I think uh, has become quite, quite paramount in a lot of the writing that I've been doing and the way that writing has inflected on my, my work um, <clears throat> is the kind of the desperate need to speak, to say something, um, and not knowing how to, how to convey the thing that is the, the, the motor behind that desire. Um, also, uh, in other points, I mean, the, the, the piece that's in here, the reason we're kind of up here, and for those who were, came to the last two, we were downstairs in Inside Us Dead Talk Love. Um, the reason we're up here, in a way, is, is, is part of that sort of certain sense of futurity that hopefully will be kind of um, pulled out during the afternoon because it's 
the last piece that I've made, but it's also a piece that um, I'm most sort of worried about, and I don't necessarily have a coherent line on yet, and I, I'm kind of hopeful of not ever having a coherent line on. Um, and potentially that, that kind of starts to speak of an unlike uh, that is current, that is now in certain ways, at least it is for me. So I guess that's kind of partially why we're in this room instead. But also, um, in terms of an example of uh, the appearance of words um, in this piece, in ribbons particularly, uh, there's, there's an awful lot, and there, you'll have to kind of forgive or enjoy or whatever the kind of crass name titling that will be continually appearing and punctuating this thing. These kind of advertorial blockbuster kind of pummelings, which um, at a certain point a desire for me to, to have text and speech and words within, within the image to a certain extent where there was a possibility that you weren't entirely sure whether you were, you were looking at them or you were reading them, and, um, which is kind of quite a rehearsed trope, I suppose, and something that uh, has uh, political ramifications in terms of uh, whether you're actually interpreting something or whether you're just being sort of pummeled by it. Um, yeah, so basically I, I kind of, uh, part of my nervousness about this event in a way is because we're in a, a situation in a, in a room and in, inside of a work that I, that I don't know yet, but I, I, I desire to speak of. But I also at some point want to hold on to my uh, incoherence around it, which I think is something that will hopefully start to, start to play out throughout the day. Anyway, I'm going to... Um, pass over to Julia to give a more formal uh, introduction um, with some housekeeping stuff and, and things like that. But um, thank you so much for, for coming along. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Welcome everybody, also from me. Thank you so much for coming to this third event. I'm very happy you're here. I'm very happy Ed is here too. Thank you for coming for the third time. It's very special, I think, to do that in a three-part uh, moment. And as this is the last one, um, all of the preparations have been extremely intense and gratifying, but this last one, of course, was particularly dense, and I learned an awful lot from all of it, and I'm very thankful for that to Ed. And I'm very sure we learn together also a lot of what we try to learn, at least. Um, I want to extend my thanks very much also, of course, to Beatrix Hof, our director, who has, of course, made all this possible and invited it into this show and into this Kunsthalle. And my lovely team, Adi, at the te tech desk over there, master of technical situations, and Basil and his camera. And, of course, Lily for everything, everything. Above all, of course, I also thank deeply the speakers that we have today. I think it's a very special lineup again. It's a very important lineup for us also today. And I'm going to start introducing, introducing them now from the back, which includes also the non speakers of today, namely Tobias Madison, because in all of the events, we have a person more or less secretly here that. Um, just listens and thinks about it and tells us afterwards in some sort of response what the hell happened. And Toby will do that. Toby in Zurich, I think, doesn't need much of an introduction. He's an artist here, just returned to Zurich. Very happy to have you back. And um, we'll reply, as I said, only after the symposium in maybe a book later or, of course, online. And you can read it, look at it, whatever it's going to be later. Our final speaker will be Adam Kleinman, who I'm very happy to have here because Adam and I worked together in my last job on Documenta 13. He has been the agent of the public program there. I was more realizing things. And he is an editor of things at Witte de Witt in Rotterdam now. He is a writer and critic for almost everybody on this planet. And um, he's also an occasional performer and curator as well. Um, before Adam, we're going to have um, a presentation by James Rickards, which is the sad moment of today because James fell ill 
last night, which we're very sorry about. But he prepared a program of screenings that we're going to see by the title of Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. They were on screen anyway. And we're going to have an introduction by and for James Rickards later. James Rickards is a video artist who just now, today, closes a show that is called Arms for Birds at the Cabinet Gallery in London. And his own work is shown at Rodeo Gallery, has been shown at Chisholm Hale in Gallery in London and at the Tate Galleries. And um, he also uh, is a resident and artist in resident in Berlin right now at the DAED and has participated in Venice by Yemiel and Lyon by Yemiel last year. What's going to happen before that is a coffee break, which I think we'll need at some point. The coffee is going to be served downstairs at the entrance desk. It's available for you there. And I ask you already now to stick to the 15 minutes more or less because it's a long day and we want to have it choreographed as good as possible. Um, we have uh, the last thing before the break, um, a poet here today, Anne Cotton, which I'm very excited about her presentation. Anne is, has um, an American and Austrian background. She's going to speak in English today too, as we all will. And uh, she has published already by now an impressive amount of poetry, but also theoretical work. Her thesis has been published, that is called, it's only in German, unfortunately, Nach der Welt, Listen der konkreten Poesie, which I very much recommend you to see. And her, my favorite, I'm going to confess, is uh, Florida Räume, which is a um, further book by her of 2010. And she has published in English, together with the artist Kerstin Schmelka, a book also with um, visual work that's called I Coleoptile. And this year, I think, forthcoming is The Quivering Fan, which is a collection of short stories. But also Anne is performing occasionally with the writers Monika Rink and Sabine Show as the Rotten King Show. Should you have a chance, please see that. Uh, I will have a brief conversation with Anne afterwards, and the co conversational moments after the talks also, of course, invite you very cordially to ask your questions, whatever it is. If you feel it's got to be in German, I'm happy to try to translate. So this is also a moment for you to speak back to us very much. The opening and very first talk will be given by Joe Luna, who has contributed a very important essay to the catalog that is called Against Immortality as Such. And if Joe is not distracted by conference papers and these kind of things. He is a PhD student at the English department in Sussex, working on something too complex for me now to reframe, but um, we hope next year or as soon as possible it's going to be published, and I'm already very much looking forward to that. And of course, to his talk that we're going to hear now. So please we join me in welcoming Joe Luna. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Uh, thanks very much, um, Julia, and thanks to Ed uh, for inviting me here to do this. It's very exciting. Um, there's a handout that I think is going around um, with a few reference cues on uh, containing the quotes and the poems that I'll talk about. I just want to say a couple of things before I... Um, give the paper itself. Uh, I should first apologize for my complete lack of, of German. I chose rather perversely two important objects for this paper by, by German writers uh, who I cannot read in the original, um, so they're necessarily for me in translation. Um, if there are uh, contradictions or, or, or uh, uh, divergences of sense um, for German speakers in those texts that, that come out during my reading of those texts. I'd be really glad to, uh, to hear about them and to uh, discuss them. 
The other thing to say is that uh, reading this on the plane over here, I was uh, thinking about changing almost every single sentence. So it's a very experimental uh, attempt to figure something out. So I hope you'll bear with me. Okay. Every time I write a paper or give a talk about poetry or a poem, it gets more difficult to do so. Why is this the case? It does not get more difficult to read poems, and although poems do not stay still, and although the poems that I do read demand all of me and all of my attention when I do read them, I do not feel like I have a comprehensively different relation to poetry to the one I had when I wrote the last paper I delivered on the subject. There is something confusing to me about the law of poetry's genre, which is essential to poetry. This much seems obvious. That it remain confusing is probably important, though that doesn't help much. The poetry that I've always admired most is the kind of poetry whose possibilities seem endless. This makes the poetry that I love extremely difficult to talk about with any concision or precision. I suppose it is a utopian notion because endlessness under current conditions does not make much sense as an emancipatory or especially contradictory or antagonistic or anti-capitalistic principle. The difficulty of talking about poetry is utopian when it is the difficulty of an attempt to name that which the poem is incapable of naming as a future which we do not own. In 1951, Theodore Adorno named this utopian notion, described in the phrase his English translator renders as the standpoint of redemption. The last aphorism of his book, Minima Moralia Finale, describes, quote, the only philosophy which can be responsibly practiced in the face of despair, unquote, which Adorno firmly believed was the only face worth looking at, in the following terms. This is on your handout. Perspectives must be fashioned that displace and estrange the world, reveal it to be with its rifts and crevices as indigent and distorted as it will appear one day in the messianic light. It is the simplest of all things because the situation calls imperatively for such knowledge, indeed because consummate negativity, once squarely faced, delineates the mirror image of its opposite but it is also the utterly impossible thing because it presupposes a standpoint removed even though by a hair's breadth from the scope of existence, whereas we well know that any possible knowledge must not only be first wrested from what is, if it shall hold good, but is also marked for this very reason by the same distortion and indigence which it seeks to escape. That's... Adorno. I would like to suggest that the gap that Adorno describes, that between the scope of existence and a standpoint removed even by a hair's breadth from that existence, can consist in the difficulty of talking about poems. Poetry opens this gap, which swallows the particular into the normatively universal even as it emerges from the consideration of the particular as the only responsible task in the face of despair. It is the simplest of all things, not only because that hair's breadth can be expressed in or by a line break or a rhyme, but also because talking about poetry is generally embedded in the language of dissent and dissensus that demands a better world, yet it is also the utterly impossible thing because that demand becomes aggressively presumptuous to the point of reckless utopianism as soon as the consideration of poetry reposes within the very framework of establishing itself as a naturally emancipatory model. In 1956, Brecht wrote the following poem, which I'll read in the English translation from 2000 but which is in both German and English on, on the handout. And I always thought the very simplest words must be enough. 
When I say what things are like, everyone's heart must be torn to shreds. That you'll go down if you don't stand up for yourself. Surely you see that. That Brecht wrote this poem when he did, at the end of his life and in the middle of a century, speaks volumes about the kind of simplicity that must be enough. In Brecht's poem, the simplest of all things is the crushing weight of demystification, demystified, wrought into a new simplicity. When I say what things are like, everyone's heart must be torn to shreds. Surely it goes without saying that enough is a lodestone of ironic counterpoint that dissevers the effort required to achieve anything like it from any intimation of the opposite to or even a situation a hair's breadth removed from what things are like. Must be enough for what or for whom to tear people's hearts to shreds or to be able to say that Is Brecht's poem just a sarcastic admission of the paucity of critical representation? Is it a joke? Yes and no. The bluntness of the tone in this poem, as in much of Brecht, is both the vehicle and the object of its satire. It is never enough. In the face of despair, that it must be enough is not incredulous that it can't, but is rather the constant reapplication of the pressure of a revolutionary imperative that makes the poem beat with such eloquent insistence in the first place. Barely five years after Adorno's mock heroic sign-off in Minima Moralia, Brecht's poem reads as a paean to the simple impossibility, or rather, the impossible simplicity, of fashioning perspectives that require nothing less than everyone's heart must be torn to shreds. It is as if Adorno's speculative standpoint is extenuated across the length and breadth of these lines in the time of their reading, shunting back and forth across the infinitesimal infinity between the very simplest words and must be enough, constantly flaring up as the subtextual backdraft of the almost agonizingly sardonic everyone's heart must be torn to shreds. Today, it is difficult to keep this demand, loaded as it is, from sliding into a kind of critical tagline for the arraignment of bourgeois liberal philanthropy. The shock of the recognition of alienation become the bleeding heart, perpetually pumping out the kind of saccharine pity that maintains the charitable liberal in a relation of delayed disgust with his or her pitiable objects. That difficulty is more inescapable the more the simplicity of the poem's affect is taken to be the uncomplicated ideology critique of its message. But I think that rather than estranging the world and revealing it to be, Brecht's poem endlessly recapitulates the dialectic of resistance to despair that entails the recognition of the difficulty of making simple what is more and more difficult to maintain, and that is the possibility of a future. Brecht's poem resists being made into an emblem of resistance by the sheer endlessness of its commitment to the lived time of political and affective differentiation. What must be enough is never enough, forever. Nearly too much is, well, nowhere near enough. At this point, I I take slight issue with the suggestion in this symposium's brief that, quote, poetry provides resistance, unquote. To name that provision too soon, to name it as the universal characteristic which criticism assumes is the dissent with which poetry is uncritically invested, that it operates in the world as a shortcut to the standpoint of redemption, is to name precisely that by which poetry is divested of its powers of endless criticality and subsumed back into the world which so easily accommodates our resistance to it. If poetry resists anything, it resists the easy ascription of itself to a static model of resistance which it supposedly proceeds to exemplify. Before it resists anything, poetry resists being made into poetry. 
I think Brecht knew this only too well, which is why his poem closes with the incredulity that its imperative had thus far resisted, that you'll go down if you don't stand up for yourself. Surely you see that. Provides an icon of a segue into individualistic caprice that would betray the commitment to opposing the truth of what things are like by subjugating it to the precarity of personal survival. By ending his poem in this way, Brecht allows its central dialectic, epitomized in the hair's breadth between what I say, when I say what things are like, and everyone's heart must be torn to shreds, to persist uninterrupted for as long as the poem gets read. The British poet J.H. Prynne recently gave a talk at the University of Sussex in which he described the futurity inherent in poetical composition. As soon as you have even 10 or 12 words, suggested Prynne, you open up a space for their arrangement into a formation which has never before been present in the history of the language. Prynne described this constant possibility as one of the greatest and most extraordinary privileges of poetical composition. The first lines of the first poem in Prynne's 2005 collected poems, which is on your handout as well, read, the whole thing it is, the difficult matter, to shrink the confines down. Poets repeatedly shrink the confines down in order to be able to deal with the historical trauma of their inheritance. If they did not, they would not be standing up for themselves, let alone anybody else. Philosophers do this too when they talk about poetry, when what they really mean is en coup de day or holdelin. But this condition of simplicity, of shrinking the confines down, of poetry's radical economy of means, the simple act of breaking a line in the first place, this condition is part of what makes the time of reading verse so intrinsically paradoxical, so irresistibly propulsive, and yet so endlessly repetitive. Prosody is a tool for making a future that is impossible to articulate otherwise. That is not to say that prosody is redemptive, but that it presupposes and fleetingly inhabits standpoints unthought in linguistic expression before the poem gets written. Another British poet, Douglas Oliver, a contemporary and dear friend of Prynne's, believed wholeheartedly that the stresses in lines of poetry were the actual sites of fleetingly lived intersubjective encounters between poet, author, and reader. This seems positively magical to me. And yet there is an extremity to Oliver's thinking about prosody, which, by attention to the microscopic articulations of spoken language, presents an example of relationality unthinkable outside the radically discrete confines of written verse. Such a thesis speaks to a community of readers as part of the preconditions and the energies of composition, a community literally activated and brought into being by the scene of reading and writing. Poetry is intrinsically futural. It delineates a relationship to the future that is both simple and impossible. It makes a future by refusing to relinquish its possibilities of commitment and thoughtful pressure to the critical idiom of the spectacle of resistance. I think that the demand placed on thought by the attempt to fashion the impossible perspectives that Adorno describes could help to formulate a criticism that would define poems not as loci of resistance, serene in their localized discretion, but rather as the echoes of the future from which resistance gains its energies, tactics, and emotional intelligence of possibility. Perhaps this would help us to think about poetry as the historical expression of presently ineradicable social contradictions, rather than, as it sometimes feels with the resistance model, as the cauterization or suppression of those contradictions in the service of defending the authentic remnants of a life already given over to its pre- post or sub-aesthetic abolition. I wonder 
if this might either intersect with or entirely bypass Jacques Rancière's polemical distinction between the pretentious uselessness of critical art conceived as such on the one hand and the critical attention to the dogma of the equality of the intelligence on the other, by which lights his theory reinterprets entire swathes of 20th century art as the historical hangover of the failures of didactic methodology and of the misguided ontological compartmentalization of art and life. Rancière's theory is designed to affect a radical sea change not just in the designations of critical art theory, but in the production of works of art committed to an anti-capitalist critique. It suggests, Rancière suggests, a reorganization of that critique on the basis that the equality of the intelligence is best served by attention to what he calls the being together in being apart, which constitutes for him, if I understand him correctly, the possibility of community building in artistic practice along non-sovereign anti-capitalist lines. What if the disregard for the critical commonplace of poetry as resistance per se helped to further the composition of poetry whose quality and register of attention took nothing for granted except the futurity inherent in its practice as the impossible simplicity of its movement out of this world? Might this condition of impossibility be a fruitful one in which the possibilities for effective redistribution and intensities of feeling, of subjective reorganization, and of the articulation of the limits of class fantasies become profoundly endless? Or would it simply strip from poetry any distance or distinction from the world in which it gets written, rendering it the surest mirror image of the face of despair at which it winks back knowingly from the glass? The final poem I'll talk about uh, is on your handout too. Here is a poem published in 2012 by the American poet William Fuller, which I'll read. I've been enjoying these moments of unconscious travel touched by death hints or impressions of an alien wilderness, first heat, then rain, then paradox. But there's a trace of something else that slips in and is felt along my shoulders. Last week, I became more aware of it. Whose thoughts do I hear now, and what is happening inside them? They concoct what I'd call a musical thesis, and it's unusual to encounter it taking place near so many trees. How did I not see, and in the midst of this, not carefully take note of, not its reluctance to make itself known, that was fairly clear, but that and how it wove itself into every substantive articulation, motivated them in fact, heightened all their elements almost to glistening, even the spectacle of its own disappearance along the perimeter it defined. And though everyone keeps talking, the sun burns right through them, and all I see is a spot on the sidewalk which reverberates. The difficulty of talking about this poem, for me, is that its beauty is predicated on a kind of luxurious aesthetic cannibalism, which I will now attempt to follow and which concludes this essay. Fuller's work often feels moved by some unseen, unconscious trace that weaves its way through the poem, never quite revealing itself, but nonetheless intimating that it, this something else, underpins the possibility of the production of any scene or scenario the poem might concoct. And it is in this sense that the musical thesis herein is agent and saboteur alike of every substantive articulation, to, su to such an extent that it incorporates itself into the thoughts that belong to some anonymous individual, even the spectacle of its own disappearance along the perimeter it defined. That is, the disappearance of the musical thesis, what happens inside a cognition, access to which is predicated on its distinction, its independence from one's own, takes place at the limits of that thought's concoction, a disappearance that is experienced as a spectacle, as if the products of thoughts are witnessed disappearing through the optic of a mediated social relationship born of their very concoction by the image which the poem expresses and which is the poem. 
This obscenely compressed description of the oxymoronic spectacle of disappearance traces just one of the poem's innumerable moments of internal reverberation, disconnect, and contradiction that are the propulsive organs of its curiously restless futurity. Grammar in this poem is the operative mechanism of impossible continuity, repeatedly folding the cumulative sense of the lines back upon its previous objects so that reading becomes a practice of syntactical cartography. The poem unfolds concentrically, since you hold the musical thesis in your mind as it winds its way through the various accommodations of more and more complex associations and relations of the pronoun it with its various objects and environments until it, fat with retrospective syntactical inheritance, expands and extenuates into the flat line linearity of its own disappearance the militarized perimeter into which it is subsumed and which is a product of its own definition. The poem proliferates more intimate complexities of sense and relation between its objects than its pronomial relations can possibly fulfill in a single reading. As such, it renders the most complete expression of its potentialities inaccessible by dint of the formal expression of its possibilities in the first place. The distance from this world which the poem opens through a nod to the speaker's dreamlike, unconscious travel is bound by this proliferation, syntactically, imagistically, and spectacularly, to the thoughts whose concoctions define their own boundaries over the course of their materialization. But these thoughts belong to a person who is not the speaker of this poem. Fuller's poem is beautiful because the sleight of hand that produces, sorry, the sleight of thought that produces the illusion of captivated rumination is at the same time the self destruction of its attachment to an endless negation. It is beautiful to watch that thought go, and it is beautiful to find it clinging to the underside of the Mobius strip of the world for which it is too responsible to abandon. But what has responsibility got to do with it? The impossible simplicity of the poem's closing couplet burns right through the scowl of precious contractual obligation to the language of futures both temporal and financial, as it does through the sound of everyone talking, if we can imagine what that would sound like. Its final humble object is a spot on the sidewalk which reverberates, closing the poem with a public scene of intractable, persistent movement, the speaker turned directly towards a point of common orientation and universal sustenance. The tone is quietly ecstatic. The face of despair is a desperately bourgeois ruse. That's it, thanks. As a half-native speaker trying to write the best text possible in the best English possible to still keep in mind that I'm speaking with a non-native speaking audience and I, I've, I've tried to keep it simple but please say if you don't understand a word it's absolutely no problem for me to stop a moment and use a different word or something. And. I said I would bring a speech that is called the Munich speech that I didn't give in Munich three years ago, but I'm not going to give it again, and like then, I'm giving it as a handout, in this case in an English translation. 
And you will see on the handout that from the third page on, I had not yet finished the second correction of the text and was doing it with fountain pen on the trip here. And I chose to copy this raw second version to give as a handout because it demonstrates in a graphic way this kind of mania for finding exactly the right adjective, exactly the right abstract term, and the right verb that sets it in exactly the right relationship with the other two abstract terms that I'm trying to give as, a, as an idea. I think we are all agreed upon that it's not quite clear what an idea is, and whether poetry or theoretical discourse is the best way to, or is the best medium or form of existence for an idea. I tend to think that the, the visual arts or the visual and physical arts are maybe the best forms for ideas because language has the obvious problems that we, ex we have been experiencing. And also, I've found that after a phase where I was writing exactly like these boys were just writing, which you may also re read if you see the handout, I've been trying really hard to reduce the, the adjectives, reduce the mass of sentences, and try and put more space around one sentence. Or one title. So often, like, you will know the titles of artwork are much better or much, you know, the, what a title does is like 20 tons and what the artwork itself does without the title is maybe two tons or a lot of fluff or something, but it's the title that actually does the work. And also, and perhaps what the kind of work that it is doing is that it's tying this physical object, or it's, it's, it's like the verb in a sentence in that it, it creates the relationship between the work of art and the context, i.e. the society that it's placed in. Also the gallery, the economic status of the country that it's exhibited in, of the visitors, etc. So when in a place here I saw an artist book with the title Blasted Allegories, I immediately started laughing and asked myself why. Because I thought blasted allegories sounds for me like a parody of the principle of using an adjective and a noun in plural as the title of an exhibit. And I liked that and tried to find several other examples that would be doing the same thing and came up with a title like Fucked Up Toilets for a conceptual art exhibit. Smeared makeups for an exhibit of digital photography. And then I realized this is about new forms of literalness because digital technology gives us instances where something that until now we've been using as a metaphor suddenly becomes literal. For example, for example, um, I can't think of an example, maybe I'll leave this abstract. But enough of free speech. I did prepare a secondary short speech. But I also prepared some poems. So I'll start with the poems first. They're not so many because they require maybe more. I don't know what they require. I'll just do it. Poem first, first poem. Stick your pants up your shirt, we're going out. On the way, I will tell you why you must fail. It is because you are... N Actually, this, do you hear the sound of this microphone? I found the, the effect really neat to see Ed Atkins' work that makes one so aware of, of sort of the memes and the emotional memes in someone's face speaking. And made, I don't know how you think, but it made me wonder about 
um, how exactly the teaching process goes or the, the, the mapping process. Does it, how much of Ed Atkins' personal way of speaking is in there and how much has Ed then learned from the algorithm or is Ed Atkins actually mimicking the avatars in the way he speaks now, I wondered. But apart from that, this, this sound is a sound that's very familiar to me from museums. It's always this acoustic piece sort of droning in the background, three rooms ahead, and then you, you sort of slowly approach it, and it sounds like this. And I found it very difficult to follow the actual text because of this hal, you know, this... Uh, but I'll try to read the poems anyway. I wish it were a bit more crisp, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. So. It is because you are not becoming any different than you have always been and had your thoughts, etc. Life isn't canticles. Grammar exists. To remember it is unpleasant. As if you were to repress your instincts to fit into a lady's shoe. You think, with enough breeze and muscles, no, you will fail just as you are. And the lady's shoe will stand, a beloved woman upright in it. Poem number two. Again and again I meet these other people. It tastes like earwax. And I pull him out of my nose easily when he is stiff. As long as it goes, to me it replaces all other measures. He me questions, I him repeat. Eat beige, peel ferns, nothing matters. Thus we will wander and wander because it is so far True sentences are of no use. How to cook a flour-based soup is a speech one can always give when anybody asks anything. Say no and look disgusted. Say yes and look vulnerable. Say nothing and look elegiac. Elegiac from elegy. The well-paid job dispenses you from everything direct and kills you, your employees, and your family. Constraints, the shortest path deigned wisdom. How to create factual constraints is explained by the news. But that is clear, it doesn't interest me. Keep working, never be absent, so that thought is always work. Unfree, intelligent. Free, dumb. To dissemble and show, to dis yeah. on the one, to dissemble on the one hand and show on the other hand how it came about, it takes a freak idea. Journalism with no idea is like Africa without women, Europe without alcohol. What was that? Oh, journalism with no idea. Okay. Here is a different poem that's a very lyric poem. It works with uh, repetition. Open the door, glance back from the light. Don't like my gesture, glance back from the light. Take your food from the hands of others. In mind, be like a cool darkness. Take your food from the hands of others. Cat, one eye upon my faults. As if I had never before pulled raisins out of my nose. Cat, one eye upon my faults. He left the lubricant on the bedside table and an unused condom, emblems of his bravery. He left the lubricant on the table. There's a cool um, site, I forgot what it's called, but it's a, an open source site where different people speak in English but in accents from all over the place. I had to think of that because it seemed interesting to me the kind of... Joe Luna had a, a kind of tone, sort of a regional or socio-stratic tone that was like 
Isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? Which you must agree with, because it is interesting. It's actually so interesting that the level of interest is fairly constant and fairly high. Whereas at Atkins, had a, the, something that I know more from Americans, that it's sort of calmed down. It's all no problem, and it's all really normal, actually. And <laughs> it was a funny to see, hear them back, go back and forth. So maybe I'll, I'll do the, the fresh text, and then I'll end with a few more poems. That might be a good thing. So the super, super dingst uh, text is very fresh. The delight with which the well-dressed Brazilian in Zurich airport indulges his whim on the telephone attracts my attention. I wish I could create such casual well-being when talking to my loved ones on the phone, well, when talking to my loved ones on the phone. Aside, as a topic, this refers to the new movie, Her, an acute conversation piece. And now I was about to go into a longer dissertation about Scarlett Johansson and the Zurich underground magazine that praises her highly today for showing herself unimproved, whereas they, um, whereby they forget the pose. And she is still improved by being a film star and being thus encouraged by success to improve her pose in perfection or something. And the reason Walt Whitman was in my head was because my friend pointed out to me that he's being used to advertise iPads. And we were like, wow, what's the world coming to? This is interesting. On the other hand, it's not that interesting. Because on the one hand, I always did know that, or I had the feeling that Whitman was a, Whitman's mind is a bag of pathos apps, though I didn't have the, oh, this is an example for a metaphor coming true. I, I had the, the concept of something like pathos apps, but I've only been able to find the, met the metaphor for it since apps have been invented. And it's actually only the famous name that makes it feel like a milestone or a sort of a, an iconic thing of arts being used in ads, but in fact, the arts or artistic techniques have been used in ads ever since ads exist. And then it gets rather chatty. Does anybody know Princess Superstar, musician? Recently, she, she, I wondered what she was doing, and she got a baby, and she's doing, she did an ad for a breakfast cereal, which I found really, and she, but she was like, she's very sarcastic, and she's a good sport, and, but her sarcasm has probably turned into her identity and lost, sometimes lost its character as sarcasm. So when she said, fuck you, I love money, she meant it seriously in a way for her, but at the same time, I still am such a believer in her style, that her style is also smarter than she actively is, that I believe that it's sarcastic, although she doesn't actually mean it in a sarcastic way anymore. But back to the Brazilian. The appraisal of his person is unseparated from hypotheses about his place in the global economic network, which means it is highly suspicious for a rich-looking foreigner to be in Switzerland. which is not about morals, but about aesthetics. I cannot enjoy his sincere laughter with his wife on the phone because his assumed situation, i.e. being rich and at ease in an airport cafe, makes me conclude he's either callous or stupid. But then I also know that it's very easy to forget everything and that people go crazy from affluence. Uh, if you have seen the new Woody Allen movie, it's a very good demonstration. Blue Jasmine, I think it's called. And I think it's based on Tennessee Williams, I heard. I think, uh, yeah, people go crazy from affluence. But thank God, the polo shirts as a style absorb and carry the callousness and stupidity that the rich themselves often forget to convey as they are no longer in direct contact with their economic situation. By which I mean that it is much easier to think that you are a babe in paradise than that you are a rich person in this world. 
and I believe that most of the rich people, except the actually active businessmen, don't really change the way they think with the growth of their capital. Or they do change, but they don't change parallel to the growth in capital. It would really mean, uh, I, all right, I, wrote, I wrote what I mean, just a minute. So some of the rich go crazy, just as some of the poor grow obese, which is, seems surprising. Of course, it's vice versa also, but that doesn't seem so surprising logically, because one would think affluence means that one has time to cultivate one's thoughts well, or at least live in a way that is fitting for one's character, or something like that, to spend time improving one's life aesthetically. Whereas if your life is a string of problems of the most um, banal nature, that can create a serious trauma. So one would think that uh, poor people are more likely to go crazy than rich people, which apparently is not the case. I think it's about even, maybe, but I don't really know. And on the other hand, the first cliche would be that poverty means physical lack, and the rich person can afford to overeat, which is also probably rich do spend more money on food, but it doesn't the the, the physical. It, it doesn't translate directly into a physical image or a physical phenomenon. So this is how one can tell that the world has got very tricky since we started to write our literature down and save it. And that is basically my thesis, that there is a connection. But the que question remains for me, is this trickiness or this complexity, as we like to call it, with a positive value added, is it a form of intelligence, or is it merely a labyrinth in the mess of stuff, which includes words? But in any case, since somehow the, the accumulation of whatever doesn't seem to have any direct implications, but the implications it has are very indirect, and, and in their indirectness quite comparable to any kind of sort of digital processes or arbitrary processes or mathematical processes. That is to say, um, it's not obvious who's rich or who's poor uh, as compared to a situation where rich people have 10 camels and poor people have maybe minus two camels or something. It could be that the, posi the, the, the mass of physical stuff has become such, such a commonplace and so detached from the idea of possession that the idea of possession was sort of like dead skin become less and less um, important or wesentlich um, and then in some way or other die out, which I would find interesting, I think, or sounds like a form of hope. The second part of this ad hoc text deals with the, is, is basically the summary of the text that, I've, that three years ago was four times as long. After translating, updating, and trimming the essay I promised to bring, the so-called Munich speech, I see that I have indeed made progress. Writing it formed the mental cement for a mental step, great for me, small for humanity, standing on which, three years later, I can summarize its contents more briefly. They were, then they were then involved tensely with me. There were a lot of knots. Logical foci, foci, ein focus, zwei foci, I wasn't yet finished with. Things were bothering me. I wasn't sure how much it was sensible to feel ashamed of my life, what I was doing, too many jobs like this one, and for whom people and context that seem to receive no effective dent from the most radical insights, though they were handled as professional thinkers and feelers. Uh, you can tell that this text is not sat for long enough because the sentence was terrible, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure how much I was, it, was, it made sense to feel ashamed for what I was doing and for whom. The text, or the, the, the reason why I had to write the text was because of understanding the figures in a knot. 
but not about reducing all knots to a series of straight strings. Although that is one possible method of understanding a knot, also employed in knot books, it is not a final result of an understanding process. Otherwise, thought would really be desertification and gentrification. Elizabethan poetry and also Shakespeare conserve the most advanced logical knot science I am aware of, which is kind of a hochgestapelte thing to say, as I have only really studied very little of it as yet, but the things I studied gave me this impression. I had reasons not to study more of it because it was important to me to finish my own language science or language um, learning process, a bit as if I were a computer and I needed a lot of data and a lot of use practice to understand what the character of the different words are. And if I learned it from Elizabethan poetry, I would too much adopt the style of Elizabethan poetry's thought. And my initial possibility to judge, perhaps, whether the Elizabethans are still applicable now or what changes would need to be made in Elizabethan world models to use their, not, their, their linguistic not skills would have been lost. So looking back at the essay, things that felt like a really painful coming out, and it had to do with things that also Joe Luna was speaking about, the, the question of the relationship between poetry and anti-capitalism it was also a very important topic for me, and also when, well, I'll, I'll say it in a minute. Um, things that came out with great difficulty can now be easily said by me, and they seem to me now a quite normal reaction to my circumstances, which was being catapulted into a performative, uh, or into a situation where before I was a student and I secretly wrote poems to document how I felt while working at a bookstore or something, so to document, it, it was effectively a kind of subversive habit, keeping, keeping up my spirits in a clandestine way. Suddenly, through the publication, I came into a, a situation where I was not only representing this, but also applauded for it and speaking to people that I had the greatest distrust for. And this situation was what prompted me or what, um, bothered me so much that I had to write this Munich speech, which was for a very good, pla uh, interesting place in Munich. That, uh, I think it's actually a very rich lady that sponsored a library and high, or very specialist niche discussions of poetry, German language poetry, called Lyric Cabinet. Yeah, so I felt uncomfortable working inside the sphere or bubble of what is dealt with as art. When writing, I felt like anything that clearly marked my text as engaged would stigmatize me as an activist rather than an artist. For despite all the exhibition-shaped endeavors to the contrary and even real progress slowly being made in the style of discourse, perhaps, the product-formedness of art, the Produktförmigkeit der Kunst, as it can be bought and collected, thus making Verstörung konsumierbar, thus making um, being disturbed a product that you can buy or you can outsource this life topic of being disturbed in general and basically hire an artist to, to, to aesthetically and philosophically deal with the topic of disturbance and help you in your life not to have to deal with it in your own way. Um, this product, Produktförmigkeit remains absolutely dominant. Even here, you know, I'm on the back of my page, you can see that I'm 150 euro, for example. Plus, plus uh, costs of co getting, coming here and, and staying overnight. Um, Yeah, and I had the feeling that the moment when people believed they knew how to categorize me, I would have blown my chance to manipulate the cliches. 
more specifically about writing, when writing, I always feel as if very heavy safe doors were going to slam shut, trapping me either inside or outside. If, if for one single moment, I failed always to keep one physical part of me between the door and the frame. And this is meant as a metaphor on the actual writing process. So this means that the writing had to be sensual enough all the time to make sure that that this sensuality was keeping the door open between me writing as a, maybe trying to write serious and engaged propagandistic leftist writing, and on the other hand, trying to write still in a way that I would force people that are not of my opinion to, underst to, to understand what I'm saying and to become convinced. And so I felt like I was using my body, that is the sensual aspects of language, to keep this door open. But it was a very stressful kind of feeling. Or to use another image that I see when I have fever. Huge tires are rolling about and burying underneath them a tiny white thread which I identify with. Which is very odd because I've had this dream since I was a child and the interpretation is, has been coming clearer and clearer that the tires are something like cogwheels or one has these images like Fishley and Weiss or, or other, um, I think in, in Shaun the Sheep there's a scene, or Charlie Chaplin also, where someone gets sucked into a factory in a mechanical way and is in danger of being physically destroyed by a non-human mechanism that also can't, cannot, so it's, it, it, it's, for me it's the image for the, the, these problems not being a matter of something that you can handle in a moralistic way because machines cannot be schuld, very suck enough English, um, cannot be at fault. And so it's, it's about, I guess, the placement and all the things we deal about in postmodern art, right? So the feeling was a, a fight against time and one, if I were careless for one moment, the chance I was using to bend and hammer the language into the shape I needed it in would be lost. And that, that is for me in the writing process, I don't know how, how Ed and Joe feel about writing theoretical texts like that, but there's a certain stress that has a very, very exciting euphoric, euphoricizing effect of this, you know, making good art right now. And at the same time, it's also really obsessive. And then, as in the most more obsessive it is, the more you often churn out really bad text. For example, here I've listed three different metaphors, which is actually too much. As a good artist and writer, I should decide which of the two or three metaphors is the best for this context. Writing this down creates bad text for, for several reasons, one of them being that poetological metaphors are trash for everyone but authors and translators. But it soothes, soothes me in this moment, which is also a massive effect. And because I think, because by writing it down, I can acknowledge the fact that I am behaving in this stressful, maniacally obsessive way, and thus, having documented it, I can stop. Maybe I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Anne. Hello. Welcome to the table. Thank you. It's nice to see you. <laughs> uh, it is very difficult to respond to that, I will confess, from the beginning. So I will start with the dumpest of dumb questions. And as some sort of an apology, I would do it on a personal level. But also trying to understand maybe a little bit more structurally, because the funny thing is, I think this 
insanity of handouts today in some way. There's, this is a warning, you're going to get more handouts. And I'm interested in how that happens. The, maybe to learn a little bit more about that moment of decision or how that decision actually comes about. You write something like a speech, and a speech is, of course, a very public thing. Like a speech is not just any text, a speech is a public address. And you talked about that beautifully, like the persuasion, the propagandistic implications of speech. And then at some point, you withdraw, and you say, I'm going to give you this paper. And I want to learn a little bit more about that relationship between these two things, like the speech and this paper with handwritten notes, even, in terms of intimacy, maybe buying time, or other implications that you feel about these two fold addresses to others. Well, I think the thing about written literature, and the thing that also could be relevant about it, which is my thesis that the history since written literature has been a, a very characteristic deformation. I think it, it creates several very characteristic illusions that have a certain effect and that are great possibilities for shy people. I used literature initially f for expressing myself in a, in a very open way, in a very experimental way, with no fear or no, also no, none, no influence of the, of the unbewusst sort that you get when you're actually talking to someone. And so you have the feeling writing that it's only me and the topic, me and the dragon or something and then you get involved in this issue, in this fight, and then it's some, that's why I think texts can be such very intimate experiences that if you're lucky in your lifetime, you may meet some people where you have similarly intimate um, discourse, but it's very rare and very difficult to do, whereas with text, it's the easiest thing at all. And it also, of course, being a text, a text is mechanical and cannot be at fault. Therefore, it also frees you from the antagonism that often happens if two individuals are speaking with each other that have different opinions. You can use certain formula to agree to disagree or sort of bullshit like that, but in fact, it, it remains difficult to actually talk or accept ideas at the moment. But ideas have a way of, of having a long-term effect. So that's probably the reason why I chose to serve this text as a take-home doggy bag lecture and prefer to imagine people doing what they like with it and maybe sometime finding it someplace and reading it importunely from between some books or something than the lecture situation which had become more and more odious to me as, as events that happen that create this atmosphere of maybe rührung, maybe um, pathos or um, elation, but usually, as far as I know, except for very impressionable young people like myself, have few actual effects in people's life, or maybe a few, but it, it, it's better to have the text. It's a really beautiful description because I felt like when you spoke about the commodification of this speech situations and, and all the performativity of it, I thought, okay, then the handout is some sort of a gift economy more than that. Like it's, it's you know, I felt like, okay, maybe that's the cue that you would want to have these different economies involved. But now that you're saying it's a doggy bag, which I really like, I feel it's more a domestic labor service that you're doing to the audience. Like you pack your lunch. I mean, it's not as a housewife. It's not, you, you're not to terribly excited about doing that. You just want to have that person well, I nourished. I made it and somebody should on. eat it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So I like that very much, thank you. Um, the other thing that really struck me is, of course, I mean, the paradox of speaking about hermeticism. And in the abstract we prepared, and in the earlier version of the text that I had, um, 
you had that wonderful, wonderful sentence that sticks with me still, it's which, where you say, hermeticism doesn't claim universality, it says come. And I want you to talk a little bit more about that pulling and pushing and coming and going and leaving of your dealing with hermeticism. Yeah, well, as I think it hangs together with also with the um, problem of propaganda that I was talking about briefly. That I've been trying to develop forms of speech that that are like, well, the, the, you know, the, that use the various powers of grammar to to be terroristic or to be coercive or to be um, to to sort of smuggle ideas in, but. The, the, the premise is always that it has to be a text that I like and it has to allow me to be honest in it. So, no, the, che the, the, the tricks are cheap, but sometimes you can use cheap tricks without, without so in, a, in, a, in a not cheap way or something, in a, in a useful way. You know, sometimes the cheap um, device is just simply the best, like duct tape or whatever. But sometimes you need a really expensive thing. But what was it? There was a, the, the grammar and the <laughs> last chapter. <track. laughs> okay, maybe because that still fascinates me, of course, and that's also again like really me being interested in this text. Is speaking of grammar, which of course in programs, as in not only computing but public programs too. You know, it's like. It's the echo of a grammar in a program which has formats that speak or exist. And, and I wanted to ask you, because you said that earlier at some point, I don't remember where, or in an email or something, where you said the, you see readings of this kind as, as reconfigurations of social situations that what we just experienced. And I feel that's really beautiful, but not only that, I want to really ask you, like, sincerely interested, and I hope not only me, how, like, this reconfiguration, how do you think of it, like, because that's also the part, the sentence that came before the sentence that Joe quoted of us, that we believe within certain reconfigurations, there might be moments of you know, withdrawing, doing it differently, resisting or not, responding. And I still think that's a really crucial, but still terribly difficult moment of actually this configuration, like undoing things, taking things apart, reassembling them. Do you want to speak a little bit about how you try, do, or hope to do that? I think, on the one hand, it may be difficult. On the other hand, it's something that's happening all the time. You know, the way the, the nuance of a book of the vocabulary changes or the, the style of speaking and stuff. So actually all the time when you're listening to texts, you're slightly readjusting the, the meaning that you have in, your, your, in, in the dictionary of your brain. It's always been being, being optimized and updated and sometimes more, sometimes less. But you know, even old people are using computers and saying handy and stuff. It's, it's, it happens all the time. And so it seems to me that it would be interesting to try and influence these processes. And, and, and it's done, that, that's why I'm interested in, in ad, advertisement and propaganda, but not very because it's so much ugly material to deal with. But like I was, I was trying the other day to, you know, Ezra Pound has a lot of poems where he says, oh, my songs go out and do this and this and this and this and this. And Usually it's go to the so-and-so, go to the so-and-so, go to the prude and lift their skirts and go, go to the practical people and jangle their doorbells and say, I do no work, I will live forever. And that's sort of the, the ghost. And then I was trying to reformulate and make a list, sort of a list of tasks for the songs that formulated, and that was more by chance, I was surprised myself, formulated these tasks like sort of a, neoliberal controlling organization would, would restructure, would, would be trying to restructure the, the style in an office or something to, to make it more efficient, to, to vitalize it.
so x so x asleep at the wheel windscreen tears streaked speeding x so very real and nightmare across the wheel x asleep at the wheel and again already x seen astride a huge colorless mare a bolting snorting silhouette on the horizon at dawn x hammering the bars and really hard x wheeling about the bars x staving off repulsion with nothing but messianic poised fingers and an electric razor x dissociating hardcore x metamorphosing performance recognition divine exile dislocation slipped x hard disk slipped mickey drink slipped down without and so then prone in bed hands free hooked up straws absurd x defrauding families up and down the country all consensual and over excellent drinks don't worry x resuscitating long dead treasured pets and sons and long defunct markets and other people's long lost jobs in yet other people's too open and wet mouths mouth to mouth an echo of obsequious agreement concerning sex with absent partners x that big pig toed succubus inhaling evaporating pachin for divine vapor mouth to mouth holding blasphemous forth subsequently and so drunk clairvoyance which we take on trust in the absence of being able to get google on your phone x in some sort of late period frilly get up feigning vampirism for the sake of his own piss weak and stunk drunkard's blood paint thinner moonshine self medicated dakiri all of which are the tensile potential of spritzing X internally hemorrhaging or variations of cirrhosis payback for deferred hate all the while going somewhere anywhere X an idea of pressure building X und and outed and what the hell defeatism hysterically soused in and X downing what really could honestly be a can of full petrol or maybe as well be and maybe chased down with a full comb of matches and though unlit the threats surely what counts and X the fire despite ignites elsewhere in the brush so as to avoid suspicion and where only animals expire blackened and shined as the heel of my mouse hand material consequence held in abeyance as is our desperate want with every sip every word loosed swiped for example i drum these fingers over here and over there someone's skull gets rapped or someone's thigh gets amused X asleep at the wheel again and already X draining other miscellaneous and unknowable optics dry milk for spiritual top shelf 30 mil lack but X influence accepted regardless or specifically to affirm that total bottomlessness X notwithstanding the very real possibility of X volubly regurgitating influence downhill and avalanching in such and such gigantic sputum dreck orb gaining impossible momentum and dread acuity and melodramatic delivery until it's pretty much indistinguishable from divine retribution on stage which is x lightning bolts or flaming swords zigzagged yellow cocks or silver cocks burning with recurrent diseases the dead drunk promiscuity of gods both elemental and overly man-made like how your destroyed career might be described x or x how we all think of the birthing of tech bearded wizards and bearded prospectors digging up all sorts of all over the other places and whatever the exhumed into black mirrors and splash proof spiritual conduits that are decidedly not for the dead who are always never more than 6 steps away and with rats x don't think of the children fuck them x your hubris is devastating x as is your ignorance x look up and for all those slights nicks x those grazes the banal stigmata of x you self stigmatizing fag a drunk and before the drink tucked and fingered into cramped and burnished space a forum for snatching at the balm heavy or cocoa butter darkened hem of whatever blindingly sober waifed adored and as well as loathed gauzing for any scrap of wild eyed attention being the echo of a particularly loathsome gesture performed in some royal court in some century before this 
stupid one, which regardless understands our response as a proper bloody response, a lurch of disgust about now, about now, though and defeated and thought that when we are the laying of hands upon the nifty planchette, we only ever seem to get the most horrendous slim spirits and the connection's always conspicuously fucking bad. So this surely is not simply what he's like. This surely cannot be merely sacked off like that, X. We cannot say that, X. So and in which scenario you cannot take a joke are accused of humorlessness. As if that smile venting the accuser's head were a consequential record of amusement. <coughs> As if that smile so proudly and definitely got were not, in actual fact, some final and drastic manifestation of high-proofed hatred, hatred sloshing all over the place. My God, if only you had eyes for tonsils that X might have taken it. And then there's the fact that any kind of taking it demands submission, which I will probably, maybe, readily might have give X probably back of the hand in a corner on my own where I would have to be alone and completely mad and more than a little mad with X over there who is in here too, hunched over some drawings I can't make out from this angle and over here. And as if that smile ploughed into the accuser's fucking... Um, head would not better be described as a dead wing or a dead leg or a broken leg and by modern design or as a kind of botulism or a snake in a black canal all broad smiles drunk dog X Again. Um, so next is James Richards' program that he put together for today. And uh, as Julia said earlier, he can't be here. He's done something terrible to his back. Um, and he's in agony, So, um, which is a real shame because he's wonderful. And I've known him for quite a while now, and he's, he quickly became uh, my favorite person, really. Um, and rather than talk about the program, which there is uh, there's a, just one sentence kind of little summation in the... Um, uh, in the handout this morning, and then there's a list of the, the works that are going to be showed. But I thought I'd just say a few things about Jim and about his work. And really, this is, this is a program, but it's also a piece of his work. Um, and a lot of what Jim does is um, appropriate, I suppose. But the word seems uh, wrong for what he does, which, in my mind, has a, has a tenderness. Um, we often talked about editing quite a lot together, um, and particularly kinds of violent kinds of ed editing that, that potentially I was doing and uh, his kind of tenderness, where he somehow managed to let things be. He, he appropriated without, um, without y using stuff um, somehow. So it would often become like a program, but that it was inflected by his extraordinary kind of hospitality towards the works in it. This has very little to do with words. I mean, the program itself is conspicuously to do with uh, words embodied in certain ways. But um, uh, just to kind of give Jim a bit of praise uh, in lieu of him being here. So uh, anyway, this is mercy, mercy, mercy. Um, yeah, thanks. I will make no sign. Under the table, I will make no sign. Under the table, I will make no sign. And the tape I'll make of the sign.
There it is. Yeah? Okay. Uh, for short people now. It's okay? How is the red and the blue? I didn't know it was going to be blue. I would have taken something else. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks uh, for having us, of course. And, of course, thanks to uh, Julia and Lily for working on this, Ed for being our inspiration. Oh. Thank our wonderful technician team. <laughs> And the, um, the talks today have been really fascinating, and I really can't wait to get to the uh, discussion. Um, I'm a bit guilty, too. Uh, I did a handout. I think it's being handed out. Uh, and the reason why I did a handout is because I thought it would be overly didactic and pedagogical or pedantic to actually delineate the things that I was doing on that piece of paper. Uh, but I'll give you a little brief introduction, and it might explain why I have this pretentious title, which. Uh, Normally, you would read as a backslash or an and or, but it's meant as a line break, which is a device in poetry, of course. Um, but the reason for it is uh, I know for various reasons we came up or we have embedded in love, death, and words. Yeah? And um, for whatever reasons, partially being a writer, sometimes being a curator, being trained in philosophy, when I see three things, I have to think about them dialectically and they were kind of unresolvable, because technically that's not real dialectics. Dialectics have to actually have A and the total negation of A, and love and death are, of course, not negations of each other. So I started trying to square this in my mind, and the first thing I thought of, of course, is a Woody Allen movie, uh, which definitely has lots of words in it, but that wasn't going to do it. And what I started thinking is actually that if one wanted to put it into dialectical terms, uh, that we have actually an incomplete set, and the reason being that love, in many ways, is actually the answer. And the thing that's missing, if you follow the normal logic, is, of course, the difference of death is life, right? So how would, of course, love be the connection between uh, life and death? Um, of course, there's very obvious things. We have children, is the most simple one. But uh, more importantly, under this framework uh, rubric of words, I had to try to square that, right? So how can words be a device uh, which can lead from life and death to love, right? And quite simply, uh, as a wonderful freak of history, and it's probably not true, of course, the first text that we know that exists is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a story about how uh, the protagonist, through love of his friend, learned, learned of mortality and death and tried to overcome that by making a record or by writing a text and by building a city and writing its walls. But that got me thinking a little bit more uh, in this idea, though, of let's say if you can't find immortality or whatever through, uh, through words, let's say, that maybe there's something else that can go on. And it springs back, I know I'm playing a little fast and loose here, with, again, this idea of children. And particularly what I was thinking of, and something we've been talking about here and there a little bit, were these ideas of the ineffable or in Anne's performance, of course, I tried to speak with Anne, not through her, she can of course correct me, but that the act of performing produced something that was not on the text, not on the surface, something subtle or whatever. And interestingly, in English, that performance or that production is actually termed a conceit. And a conceit, uh, which of course we know in poetry is usually when you take two very separate things, too far comparisons, almost dialectically, and figure out some way to connect them, that word itself actually is derived from the word to conceive, to give birth, to plant a, plant a seed in. Um, so I'm going to take it from that and do something incredibly cheesy, which is to talk about a poet I don't like, a poet who is incredibly famous, uh, and generally considered a very foundational poet, to actually think about this idea, how do um, ideas, through their matching and through their wedding, actually produce new things or give birth to new things. But moreover, as I said, I promised I was going to give you a little intro to the text that I handed out, and that's actually by a poet I actually do like quite a bit, named George Herbert, who's a 17th century poet. And uh, basically what he thought about, we have our classical uh, division, of course, in language, 
and art and in, in things in general between the form of something and the content of something. And throughout history, these have always been debated. And of course, Hegel is the guy that brings this to the surface, uh, Mr. Dialectics. But what you see in um, Herbert that's quite interesting and why there's that line break, and if you look at the handout I gave you, is the notice of how the words themselves become volumes and shapes, but moreover, how those become conceits, where the word is twinned or paralleled to its placement on the page, to its meaning, and more importantly, its choreography within the sentence construction. And in so doing, it creates a parallel text. It create, gives birth to another idea. However, the amazing thing about Herbert or whatever is that parallel idea is not written, it's not in form, it's not in content. It can only be produced in your mind through the wedding of those two things, right? So in many ways, the ineffable or the most interesting thing sometimes in text in that example graphically is how you produce something that's actually not there, right? But as I said, I'm gonna to go to a poet I don't particularly like, and that's T.S. Eliot. And I'm actually not a poet, I am a, generally a non-fiction writer. So for me, the structure or technique is not obviously line breaks and all that stuff, because it would look quite weird to do that in the middle of a, uh, whatever, essay on the Spanish Civil War or something, let's say. But the thing that we tend to do is we play in editing, we play in pace, we play in repetition, we play in placement. And that's kind of something that I, taking out of this Eliot um, story. But the question uh, that's very interesting about that is when you make something, and especially something that's not there, how is it legible? How do you make the measure? How do you make the yardstick? Or how do you communicate that? And that's something that um, exists in this poem, which I'd like to take you through. But um, eh, let's just get to it. As I said, um, I'm more interested in the narrative, so I, I didn't give you a printout of the Eliot poem. It's called uh, The Love Song of Jail for Proof Rock, which you can find online if you want. I'll read you just the first stanza so you get a flavor of it. Um, and it's very important thinking about this idea. I was just kind of joking around that alternatively, instead of using this backslash, that this uh, could be thinking of form and content and the production of something that's not there, that this could also just be called how texts make love to themselves. So uh, that's part of the reason why it's a love song. But I'll, I'll just give you the Eliot so uh, you can get a taste of his writing and then I'll go into my total instrumentalization of it for something else. We tend to do that if you read any art criticism. Let us go, <laughs> sorry. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-desert streets, the muttering retreats, of restless nights in once cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that flow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lend you to an overwhelming question. There's ellipsis there, that's kind of important, I'll get to that. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. Okay, very silly rhymes, right? Um, I'll go into my pseudo close reading of this. Um, and just keep those themes, it's kind of high. Blech. Amongst the myriad of images that Eliot employs in the poem, like the fact that the narrative might be of an unknown artist, proof rock, failing to impress and gain a lover, a particular sentence literally stands out as it is awkwardly contorted into a short two-line stanza. Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt if something is, isn't clear or I'm mumbling or whatever. A two-line stanza with the word go, utilized as an enjambment, that's a line break, leading to a highlight the word talk after the line break. As it reads, the sentence as stanza goes like this. In the room, the women come and go, line break. Next line, talking of Michelangelo. Instead of making the mere association that Eliot is in a long line of poets, including the great Renaissance mannerist master, a so-called giant, the line functions symbolically. Eliot, the lowly contemporary artist, is intimidated by the, structure of, by the stature of a master, particularly in the company of a high society that would rather speak of ancient giants. That's the Michelangelo, the salon implied in the room of women. In addition, as this poem is, quote, a love song, the reader might think that this intimidation is also a sexual one, 
as well as an insult on Elliot's intelligence. Or, as we could say, his own creative capital is not high enough to score in this salon. His rejection here becomes twofold, both intellectual and sexual. So how to confront such a problem? Reference could be marshaled by the author to prove his knowledge base and gain admission to the vain area of debate, such as the discussion of a passage of Michelangelo's verse. I should, I'm going to interrupt for a second. I was actually thinking of this text, I resurrected this from a while ago, to tackle a certain phenomenon or I won't say problem in contemporary art where a lot of work quotes or cites or refers to things. And um, moreover, what does that simply mean? Is it sufficient? Do you get enough intellectual power or interest or whatever to simply refer to history or to go back to history? You know, what is really the use in that? And um, what I play with here, which I'll, we'll go into and play as the apt word, is there's two words in English for referent. Uh, the first is, of course, referent, which is the one we use in contemporary art uh, um, uh, language. And there's a literary term called delusion. And they're separate. Uh, they can be used interchangeably, but actually etymologically, they're very different. Uh, referent actually comes from a Latin word to carry you or to bring you back to the original source. So it's really actually a citational word. It's to bring you to something to see if it's correct, if you're using it correct. Whereas illusion, uh, which interestingly is an antiquated word for metaphor, actually means it comes from the Latin ludic, or English word ludic, or the Latin ludere, ludere which means to play with something. So instead of, what would it mean for an art practice if it's going to use history, and I mean all arts, literature, etc., not to actually take you to wink, wink, know that there's the source, but in fact to play with it, to misuse it, and even to question if it should even exist, right? And this is kind of what I'm going to say that Eliot is doing. Sorry for the digression. And although the poem is littered with various allusions, referring to something of Michelangelo's work specifically is wholly avoided throughout Eliot's piece. As such, this cannot be the goal, to simply join the salon and become a one-dimensional character. Of note here is Michelangelo's homosexuality, which could allude on a further reading to the obvious rejection of the poet to the woman and thus signal a larger break between the two parties. It would be nice to say here that on a Freudian level, this sexual disjunction in this love could imply the latent homosexuality in Eliot and thus be responsible for his misogenic overtones throughout his work entire, but I will leave such a level of concern to an actual Eliot scholar. I don't like Eliot, remember? In any case, here it would be better to tease not Michelangelo's gender roles, but to tease his dual position as both a poet and a sculptor to say that his break has to do with the shaping of form or how to structure a poem and to what effect. A few stanzas later, the line is repeated again with no change. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Through this act of repetition, the author is making a grander statement that the talk itself in the salon is dried up as the salon dwells in the same tired discourses by way of group affirmation over that of serious debate, one of the key concepts of this love song. No simple pessimist, however, Eliot does not offer an alternative through style of debating his forebearers. To unpack this, let's start at the top of the poem. This is that first stanza I read you. The first line begins, let us go then, comma, you and I, comma. Uh, the important thing here, these are the structural things, is there's a comma and a line break, which means you actually have to go literally to the next sentence to conclude it. And there's the word go, so this is the pun, where you have to actually perform going to the next line. And again, this is something that's not really there, but it's there. So uh, the line break, which implies a need to explore as the reader must go to the next line to complete the sentence. Preceding this, however, there's an epigraph from another poet, namely Dante Alighieri, with a stanza from his own Inferno. But the interesting thing is, Eliot does not quote this, you're just supposed to know this. Uh, hold on, let me find myself. Oh. For one, the nod to Dante is joined to the idea that a guide and a guest, or an author and the reader, is at play, much like the similar didactic device employed by Dante in his own various guides and other authors, Virgil, for example, to show or teach Dante the way to poetry or thought. 
Without going too far into the epigraph itself, the subject of it is a section of the Inferno where Dante talks to fraudulent guides and false counsels, which we could also assume may prefigure the women in the salon mentioned in the actual poem, the women who come and go. So as to avoid any of Eliot's latent sexism, let's stop calling them women now and just call them dwarves. And yet another analogy is made here as those familiar with the work of Dante, a true guide, so to speak, can remember his own Dolce Stil Nuovo, or Sweet New Style. This revolutionary school, this is actually what Dante did in the 14th century, of poetic invention focused on courtly love in the most mundane sense, but also foreshadows a kind of sublation theory in the Convivio, where Dante equates the sexual passion for his unrequited love with Beatrice for poetic inspiration. Keep in mind that Prufrock himself is unable to find love and turns to poetic reverie. For those of you who don't really uh, or, or remember Dante so well, he has this mythic character which he equates to the intellectual passion that one would have for sexual passion upon first having puberty. And that figure, that zeal for thought is Beatrice. Taken together, a vast panoply of possibility are at foot as all of these hints point, remember the line in Eliot, to lead you to an, over no, an overwhelming question. Of course, on the literal level in the story, it's to take the woman home and have sex with her, but there's another question going on. As mentioned in the introductory stanza, which Prufrock in the following line says, oh, do not ask what it is, let us make our visit. So again, he could be saying, let's go to the room together, but he's also saying, let's visit something else. Now, as any writer would tell you, this is incredibly boring and not poetical if he was to tell you exactly what his question is, right? However, he does tell us that we need to visit something as a clue, or more importantly, that the subject of this question cannot be spoken of, but must be demonstrated. I'm gonna conclude by a little talk on Wittgenstein, by the way. Which follows the early line is, of course, the main body of the text. So after he says, let's make the visit, the thing you read, of course, is the poem. So it would be fair to presume that the text itself is what has to be visited. But why? As the poem continues, Eliot takes us through many encounters with other landmarks of literary creation. Shakespeare, Chaucer, Hesiod, and a curious one from the Bible concerning Lazarus in the line, I am Lazarus come from the dead. As Lazarus is the name of two different characters, one a beggar who finds rewards in heaven, the other a saint who Jesus raises from the dead, a double meaning is called upon, one which again plays off the idea of Michelangelo as the embodiment of two different subjects, and thus is ambiguous. The first Lazarus is known from a parable in which a poor beggar's fate is joined to that of a rich man, as the rich man never sought to bestow any of his great gifts on Lazarus in life, when the two men die, Lazarus in return does not give the gift of water to the rich man who is on fire as punishment. This particular reading could be privileged as the epigraph from the Inferno is one of a man personified by a talking flame, not to mention the fact that the presumably rich dwarves in the salon talking of Michelangelo do not regard new attempts at art. Keeping in mind that Dante created a new style, while Michelangelo is considered the central character of the Renaissance, or the new birth, the other Lazarus, the resurrected, implies a need for a potential new life and creation amidst, the, amidst a, stale and artistic, a stale dead artistic culture wherein our dwarves in the salon can only repeat themselves by now quoting an already old line of the poem that is, they have become dogmatic. So the poem itself cannibalizes itself by using its own content as, as a reference. With this reading in mind, we can return to the title of the work itself, Prufrock. If separated, we arrive at the words proof plus rock, which can be argued is a pun on the German, and maybe I'm, my German's horrible, proofstein or touchstone. Proof is a cognate subjugation of proof, and stein can be read as rock. In this case, the song of the poem is about a touchstone, a device used to test the purity of gold. This in itself has many metaphoric meanings, which one being the touchstone is a phrase used to denote a landmark or giant work of art by which others can be compared, hence the multiple allusions to various other writers throughout the poem. On the other, a touchstone can test the validity of truth and conversely the level of fraud in an interaction. It's actually, it's totally trivial, but that word conceit 
its etymology also puts together the word receipt and the word deceit, but that's a totally trivial thing. Um, so, and yet a touchstone is also a term for inter, uh, interaction. Remember our salon dwarves. And yet, a touchstone as well is also a device that can be used to test the intellectual merit of an idea as well. Before we get into the interpretation of this overwhelming question in the poem, how to measure the value of an artwork, Eliot is offering this poem itself as a touchstone beyond the uniform and dull thoughts of the referential salon habutés. That possibly this poem, which in addition to the dense interconnected illusion features a groundbreaking style, later classified as stream of consciousness, could be the way that, that can be the way, like Dante, like Michelangelo, to a new reborn way of thinking, namely the framing of fragments, be they quotations from the world or other observations so as to draw an image of the world itself. In an almost prophetic way, Eliot is correct that his work would become the point of comparison for modernist poetry, and in effect achieves an actual touchstone status. Egoistically, this might have been Eliot's goal, and why he chose to associate his work with recognized masters, in pejorative quotes. Instead of such unproductive cynicism, let's look at another question contained herein. How was this confidence, Eliot's idea that he was as great as Dante, etc., could be installed? Here so, it's worth looking at the idea of gold and value as mentioned in the poem. As stated, a touchstone is a device in which an idea can be tested. In this poem, there are various interconnected illusions that not only function symbolically, but structurally in what is called allegory. That is to say, all of these illusions work in concert to unite a field of interpretations and meanings which fold into and confirm each other as an extended metaphor namely that the form and style of the poem itself becomes its own yardstick. And this kind of goes on, but um, basically this idea too, not only can you produce things by repetition, by creating your own values in the work, but that that becomes the thing that makes it legible. Um, but I wanted to uh, close, I, had, uh, I won't bore you too much more with this, I hope it was slightly entertaining. Um, but more so, there was this question uh, that I heard um, kind of uh, inking around today, and this idea of the ineffable, that which is expressed which cannot be said, right? And that a text maybe can perform this. And one of, in sort of fancy linguistic terms, uh, one way that I've been looking at this is there's always been a problem in language and art that it's representational and most philosophers uh, actually disregard it as such because anything representational cannot be true, quote unquote. I don't necessarily agree with that at all. Uh, this is actually Plato's argument begins this. And for this very reason, if you're in the Republic, he famously makes poets illegal. They're not allowed to be in society because of their lies and misrepresentations. However, one of the ways to say that something is representational is to say it's symbolic, to say that it functions as if something happens, right? And that is actually the essence of language. I mean, I'm not gonna give you a boring lecture on Saussure and whatever, but the cup and the word is not the same thing, right? However, the interesting thing that I think in this narrative, in the Herbert that I handed out to you, et cetera, is even in that, in the act of representation, the way that you combine things actually can perform something, an actual activity, uh, which is in this repetition, the word becoming self-cannibalizing and the word quoting itself in its own history. And in so doing, it actually performs as such. That means, an, instead of being representational, the way the words are, are put together, they produce a third effect that actually is a fact. And that's something that's very different and something to think about in relationship to art and in relationship to uh, poetry against things like philosophy and so on and so forth. And um, part of, I had hinted uh, that this had something kind of to do with Wittgenstein. And uh, most in particular, there's that famous last line of the Tractatus, which says, of course, I don't know the German, I'm sorry. Uh, that which we cannot speak of, we must pass over in silence, right? And that sounds really kind of enigmatic and whatever. But what he's actually saying is some things need to be shown and some things need to be demonstrated because they're complex, because they're uh, associations, connections, context, social relations, etc. And it's too simple to actually speak about that 
then you would be representing it. So it's kind of philosophy turning back on itself, saying that philosophy is often a form of representation. And what Wittgenstein means is that that has to be shown and that has to be demonstrated. It has to be visualized. It has to be conceptualized. It has to be made poetic, right? And the interesting thing is, even though he says you cannot speak of it, he's obviously doing it in text, right? So what he's really saying is that which we don't think we can speak of, death, for example, can only be done so in between other signs and actually the collection of signs, the collection of context and whatever can only produce through its interaction this thing that's not there that we know that's there and that could be the truth or whatever. So along those lines, I'm just going to leave you with something I wrote. It's very short so we can change the, the feel a little bit and it's about the love and death of two radio stations. It's only 300 words, so I won't bore you so much, and it's based on a true story. Oh, but more importantly, not only is it about love and death of a radio station, it's about the words that were said over the air when they died, and more importantly, which pieces of music they decided to play when they died, and actually when one was resurrected. So, sorry for the interruption. Normally, such a phrase expresses an apology. However, on August 25th, 1975, at 11 a.m., a New York DJ inched towards the mic, broadcast these words, and signaled a definitive coup de grace. By way of jubilant exclamation, the radio blared out just the last two notes of Mozart's Requiem, a funeral mass. Next. Although April 25th, 1975, was also the release date for Bruce Springsteen's landmark, Born to Run, the album had yet to hold any significance and was not the cause of celebration. In fact, WNCN, a classical music station found at 104.3 on the FM dial, not only had a distaste for rock music, it had just led a culture war against the art form. The causa belli? On November 7, 1974, the station's parent company took WNYC off the air and replaced it with WQIV, a quadraphonic progressive rock channel that sought to capitalize on larger audience potentials. Although smaller in number, several influential citizens organized protest groups and petitioned the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to block the switch as to preserve a public good and a communal need. The activists soon won a temporary Supreme Court injunction delaying the format flip. However, it didn't hold, and at 8 p.m. on November 7th, WNCN would become WQIV. With a poetic wink, WNCN pro WNCN's programmers selected the Mozart piece as their fitting swan song, but WQIV's inaugural DJ clipped the piece short. It's not his fault he probably didn't understand the full rest at the end of the piece, to not be the end itself. Adding insult to injury, WQIV then presented electric light orchestras roll over Beethoven. No one missed the symbolism. The war raged on and WNCN's community ultimately forced the station to return to its original format. August 19th was selected as the time of date for WQIV's death and its clever programmers sought out Elton John's funeral for a friend Love Lies Bleeding to play, on this, to play the station into oblivion, possibly as a retort to WNCN's preference for Mozart. Then, after a few days of dead air, WNCN came on to play the last two notes that were not played uh, two years ago on the Requiem. It was as if nothing happened. Thanks. <laughs>